Bismillah, in the name of God. Recording in progress. Um, I have spent the last pretty much 30 years, um, especially since I encountered my, my own Sufi teacher, a gentleman who was connected to three separate Iranian orders, uh, one of them a sub-branch of the Nimatullahi order, and another one um, a branch of the Kurdish Qadri order, and another one the very famous Qalandari Khaksar order, um, immersing myself in a particular movement that he was also secretly, simultaneously involved with uh, throughout most of his adult life, and that is the Bayanis. Um, Western scholarship knows the Bayanis as the Azali Babis. Interestingly enough, today I was skimming online uh, a book by American scholar K. Paul Johnson, uh, a book he wrote about uh, Blavatsky, uh, entitled The Initiates of the Theosophical Masters. Um, this book was quite controversial in its times, but the central argument of this book is that um, he claims to have identified the Theosophical Masters as actual individuals during the 19th century. And um, some of the figures that he identifies are the figures that are associated by scholarship in um, what Western scholarship classifies in the hyphenated form as the Bobby Baha'i movement. Um, except where I'm coming from, this hyphen doesn't exist between Bobby and Baha'i. Bobby, uh, or what scholarship knows as the Azali Bobbies, is a movement in its own right uh, due to persecution and also because of the schism that occurred in the 1860s between themselves and the Baha'is, they went progressively underground. Uh, and just like uh, in the 12th, 13th centuries, when you had a lot of Ismailis, the, the botanies, going underground into the Sufi orders after the Mongol assault, uh, the same uh, paradigm kind of sufficed in some way with a segment of the Azali Babis or the Bayanis, who went into uh, the Sufi tariqahs, the Sufi orders of Iran particularly. Not all of them, but some of them. And my teacher was one of these individuals. So when he found out about my own pedigree, especially about my own family pedigree, uh, because one of my ancestors was a, was a woman who was very much involved in this Bobby movement in the 1840s, uh, a woman by the name of Qurat al Ain, uh, translated as the solace of the eyes, who was renowned in her time as being the, the return, uh, not so much reincarnation, but return in the archetypes of Fatima. Uh, the, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And our order, the order that I had today, and I found it um, as a consequence of the prodding of my late teacher, is an order known as the Fatimiyah Sufi order, uh, which pays homage uh, both to Qur'at al-Ain as the return of Fatima and also to Fatima herself, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. Anyone who knows anything about uh, Shiite esotericism realizes very quickly that within that terrain, uh, there are other parameters and other considerations uh, that kind of overturn the, the usually patriarchal associated uh, paradigm with, with conventional Orthodox Islam. So in essence, I myself am coming out of a, what you would probably call a heterodox stream of Islam and also an heterodox form of Islamic esotericism, which you know, in, in short order we'll find out why. Um, but my teacher was uh, very much involved himself, and um, so when I got my initiation in 1993 from him, formal initiation, I was initiated not only in the name of the masters of the order that he held uh, outward, uh, 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 what they call the ijaza or a transmission, but also he initiated in the names of the Bab, his successor, Sopa Azal, whose text I'm going to be speaking about tonight and also in the names of the Letters of the Living, who, one of whom, uh, the most prominent member of which was Qurat al Now, The Bayani movement emerges basically on the back of another movement known as the Sheikhi school. And the Sheikhi school was a Gnostic movement that emerges in the end of the, of the 17th or 18th century. And um, both uh, was involved in a very esoteric and Gnostic enterprise, while some simultaneously uh, a very millenarian and chiliastic form. Um, these days, a lot of the members or adherents of the Sheikhi school try to minimize the, the more messianic and chiliastic elements of their founder's doctrine, but Sheikh Ahmad al Asai, a, bah a Bahraini Shiite uh, cleric, uh, basically, without intending to, um, inaugurated a school, which uh, he called the Kashfiyah, 
or, or those who disclose the truth, um, and which uh, conventional scholarship knows as the Sheikhi school. And in 1844, on, after the passing of his own successor, Sayyid Qasim Rashti, um, a group of disciples of his, prominent disciples of his, came to a light in the city of Shiraz. And one of the members of the Sheikhi school of that city, a merchant, uh, a young 24-year-old Sayyid, uh, meaning someone from the family of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, proclaimed a cause on May 23rd, 1844, uh, to whom history has now known as, in posterity as the Bab, or the Gate. The Bab's um, doctrine was also an extremely esoteric doctrine, but even more so in many elements uh, than the Sheikhi school. It was completely Kabbalistic, so the science of letters, letterism, gematria, was a very center element of this doctrine, as it was to some degree in most of, of uh, the mystical and esoteric streams of Islam. But with the Bab, it was taken to another level, um, whereby the letters and, and um, numbers constitute, in, in essence, a sort of platonic ideation you know, in, in the world of matter. Um, this movement um, had a very tragic ending. The state and the clergy in Iran um, came down on it very hard, and um, mostly because the Babis um, also, in some sense, were attempting a sort of a revolution in Iran. Uh, in overthrowing the power structure, both the power stu structure of the clergy as well as the, the ruling dynasty of the time known as the Qajars. And um, before the Bab was executed in July 8, 1850, he nominated a young, um, at the time, he was only 18 years old, uh, 18, 19 years old, uh, son of a former courtier connected to the royal cult known as Mirza Yahya Sub Azal, or the dawn of pre-eternity. And um, I have been studying Sobazal's works uh, consistently, uh, pretty much from the zeros, from the beginning of the zeros, when I um, started to get access to a lot of texts through um, members of this community who are still around in Iran, and began to uh, piecemeal translate a few items here and there. Um, in 2011, I was invited by um, uh, the SOAS in London, the School of Oriental African Studies, uh, to give a lecture on Babism, which I did, uh, entitled Post-Gnostic Apotheosis. And basically, this movement of, of the Bayanis um, can be characterized as a form of post-Islamic esotericism. Now, when I use that epithet, post-Islamic, I don't mean... Po <laughs> post as in a rupture with Islam. When we talk about post, we have to kind of um, contextualize it in the same way a lot of scholars contextualize postmodernism. Postmodernism is a continuation of modernity. Um, or it, it's sort of uh, you know, going beyond the, the set parameters of what mo modernity is, but very much uh, within that world. And the Bayan is very much um, kind of following that train as far as its post-Islamicity is concerned. And these texts are, in my opinion, and it's also scholar Dennis McEwen agrees, are some of the most interesting and rich uh, texts that exist. Unfortunately, because uh, the Baha'i schism became more dominant in the West, um, the, the Baha'is have sort of overshadowed the Bayanis. And it has only been since probably the zeros, and particularly since 2004 when a website was launched uh, Bionic.com, that um, the public at large began to realize that the Bionic community was still around. Um, the late Peter Lamborn Wilson, also known as Hakeem Bey, uh, a personal friend of mine, um, uh, came into the Bayon as of the year 2000, when he came, 2020, when he, when he contacted me uh, via a friend of his and expressed his interest to enter the Bayon. Um, apparently, this is not part of his biography on, on Wikipedia, so people can look that up for themselves, where even I'm mentioned uh, in his Wikipedia entry. And this resulted as a result of a correspondence that Peter Glenn Wilson and I had been having uh, since 2014, and I had been sending him texts via my uploads on Academia EDU uh, and elsewhere. And in his last two books before he passed away last May, uh, he both acknowledges me and also claims that I am the reviver of, of in the contemporary times, in this postmodern period, of the, the Babis, or the Azali Babis, or the Bayanis. 
Um, and in a sense, he's correct because what the Fatimiyya Sufi order represents primarily is a revival of precisely um, both the esotericism and also the left-wing uh, thrust uh, of social transformation that the Babis themselves originally pushed for. One of the texts of Sopa Azal that really caught my interest early on uh, when it was first uploaded by the members of the Bayani community in 2004 was a text known as the Seven Worlds, Awalim al Sabaa. And this text is very rich because, in a very condensed 68 page uh, discourse, Sopa Azal uh, basically lays out a visionary journey within um, certain elements of, of Sheikhi and Babi metaphysics that I find very interesting. But rather than most conventional Sufi-esque texts that, that discourse on the, on the visionary quest from the, point, from the ground up, uh, this particular text works its way from the top down. So it works from the first principle of things, which is the world of um, what he calls the primal will, uh, or the son of reality, and then works its way down to the world of, of the, of matter or the, the spatio-temporal world. So let me talk a little bit now about Sufa Azal himself. Um, his preeminent title in reference to the fifth theophanic sequence of the Hadith Kumail or the Hadith al-Haqiqa, the, the tradition of, of ultimate reality. Mirza Yahya Nuri Sufa Azal died in 1912, was born in the Arab quarter of Tehran, Iran, in 1831 during the final years of the reign of Fat Ali Shah Qajar who died in 1834. He was the son of the wealthy Mazandari, Mazandarani Qajar courtier and calligrapher Mirza Abbas Buzorg Nuri, and his sixth wife, Kuchak Khanum Kerman Shahi, who died during childbirth. After his birth, Sufa Azal was entrusted to the care of his father's fifth wife, the mother of the future Baha'u'llah and founder of the Baha'is. Before his third birthday, and at the commencement of the reign of Muhammad Shah Qajar, who died in 1844, Eight, Sufa Azal's father also died, and it appears that his care and upbringing were from this period onwards, henceforth entrusted jointly to his stepmother and his aforementioned stepbrother, who was 13 years his senior. In the same year as the commencement of the Babi movement in 1844, his stepbrother, stepmother died as well, and so guardianship of Sufa Azal, now 14 years of age, devolved upon his older brother. According to Sopa Azal's own testimony, his conversion to Babism occurred approximately during the period when the movement was gaining its formative momentum and building its base of converts between the years of 1844 and 1846. In 1847, when the Bab bid his followers to join his chief initial disciple in northern Iran in Khurasan, Sopa Azal, then a young adolescent of 15 years, immediately set out on his own from Tehran to join the other Bobby partisans assembling there. In 1848 and 9, uh, as the big commotions and Bobby uprisings were occurring, Sufa Azal began corresponding with the Bob himself. The writings and correspondences of Sufa Azal were soon esteemed highly by the Bob as divinely inspired, i.e., what he called versical signs or ayats issuing from the former's pure innate knowledge or fitra. And so in a series of testamentary epistles that were publicized widely among the scattered Babi ecclesia, Sufa Azal was formally nominated as the Bab's successor, his legatee and mirror, or mirat, whose status would be complementary to the Bab's. In other words, Sufa Azal was to be, to the movement that the Bab initiated, the Bayan, was to be an Ali, in the Shiite context, to the Bab's Muhammad. It is well worth quoting here a few passages from what the Bab said to Sufa Azal in these testamentary epistles. He says to him, you are I, I am, I am you. He and I, he and you. God, and I am God and you are God. This is a book from God, the protector, the peerless, unto God, the protector, the peerless. This is the book from, from Ali before Nabil, the remembrance to the worlds, Unto, unto he whose name is equivalent to the name of the one, Wahid, the remembrance to the worlds. O name of the one, Ya Ismail Wahid, protect that which has been revealed in the Bayan and command by it. 
for verily thou art a mighty way of truth, unquote. At noon on July 8, 1850, the Bob, together with the disciple, were publicly executed by a firing squad in the Tapri's military barracks uh, following a heresy trial that had occurred two years previously. In August 1852, after a failed assassination attempt in the life of Nasr al-Din Shah by the Babis as revenge for the execution of the Bab, Subha Azal fled to Baghdad. Later, in early 1863, the Ottoman government resettled the Babi leadership to Ottoman Turkish soil, far removed from Iranian territorial borders. In early 1867, so Baha'u'llah emphatically, once they had been moved to the Turkish territory, Baha'u'llah, his, his older half-brother, emphatically made a claim to the supreme theophanic authority of the Babis as the, being the Babi Messiah and had a circle of partisans publicly assent to it. Given that the effective machinery and apparatus of the Babi leadership was already in his hands, this challenge to Sopa Azal's authority proved like none other before it. Sopa Azal immediately and unequivocally denounced his older brother's claims, but matters escalated into violence on the part of the Baha'i zealots. The complete split of the two factions was effected by September 1867. Two notable attempts appear to have been made by the Baha'is to murder Sopa Azal, but these attempts failed. Other loyalists of Sopa Azal were not so lucky. Uh, the British Orientalist E.G. Brown, summarizing the book Hash Behesh, states, I quote, all prominent supporters of Sopa Azal who withstood Mirza Hussein Ali Baha'u'llah's claim were marked out for death. And in Baghdad, Mullah Rajab Ali Qahir and his brother, Haji Mirza Ahmad, Haji Mirza Muhammad Reza, and several others fell one by one to the knife or bullet of the assassin. As to the assassination of the three Azalis, Agajan Beg, Haji Sayyid Muhammad of Isfahan, and Mirza Reza Kuli of Tafrish, by some of Baha'u's followers in Akar, there can, I fear, be little doubt. The passage in Baha'u'llah's Kitab al-Atlas, his most holy book, alluding apparently to Haji Sayyid Muhammad's death proves that Baha'u'llah regarded this event with some complacence. In August 1868, as a result of the communal violence that had erupted between the two factions, the Ottomans banished Sopa Azal, his family, some of his remaining supporters, as well as four Baha'is to the island of Cyprus, while banishing Baha'u'llah, his family, his supporters, and four devotees of Sopa Azal to Acre in Palestine, which is now Israel. Is that <coughs> What about the teachings themselves? We're getting there. We're oh, get, good. Yeah, yeah we're, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, for Sopa Azal, the next 43 years of his exile after 1868 were to be spent in relative seclusion in Famagusta, Cyprus, were surrounded by some of his family and occasional visits by devoted relatives and believers. He was to find some measure of peace. After an illness lasting nine months that progressively worsened and surviving his older brother and rival by nearly two decades, Sova Azad died at seven o'clock in the morning of Monday, April 29th, 1912, at approximately 81 years of age. He is buried in a lot adjoining uh, Famagusta's common Muslim cemetery, then only a mile outside of the city. Now it occurs inside the city, and a small shrine has been built over it. Um, by my estimation, um, the number of works, full-length works, authored by Sopa Azal during his ministry as the successor of the Bab, approximate presently somewhere around the ballpark of 137 works. Um, these are full-length works. Some of them exceed a couple hundred pages. Um, most of them are written in Arabic, uh, although occasionally there are a few works in Persian. Um, he basically followed the Bab's own uh, stylistic uh, composition. So, for example, we have many works uh, that occur in the style of the Quran. So, just like the Bab wrote um, and was accused as of heresy for that very reason, Sopa Azad wrote works in that kind of uh, kind of high Arabic, scriptural Arabic. Uh, he wrote numerous commentaries, uh, countless innumerable prayers, um, and a uh, few works, uh, discursive works in, in Persian as well. Three manuscripts are known of the present work, The Seven Worlds. Um, two are by, in the hand of the author himself, both of which, which I brought with me, they're here. And one is by, in the hand of his son, his older son, Rezvan Ali. 
uh, that particular copy is held uh, in manuscript form in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris, in the French National Library. Um, so these works have been cataloged. Um, unfortunately, very little studies until I have been basically looking at this um, material with any seriousness. The Seven Worlds, as I mentioned, is basically a book or a treatise that is dealing with the issue of the visionary quest, but a visionary quest within the confines of a very particularly interesting esoteric doctrine. Um, and within this text, there are numerous correspondences. So the seven worlds correspond to how Sopa Azad deals with the question of the seven worlds, where in his metaphysics, the seven worlds are at the very top, the world of ha what the text called Hahut, or the realm of the Ipseity, which in the Kabbalah would be the Ein Sof, uh, the Lahut, the divine realm proper, then the world of the Jabarut, the Empyrean of power, or what the Islamic philosophers call the realm of the um, disincarnate archangelic intellects, the world of the Malakut, the world of the angels proper, then there's another world, Azamut, the mightiest realm, which is the realm where um, in both Sopa Azal's metaphysics and also in some of the metaphysics of, of, um, of Islamic Sufism is the realm wherein heaven and health are bifurcated. So the realm of Azamut is actually administered by angels rather than demons. There's no separation um, in Islamic eschatology between heaven and hell. They're just two domains administered by angels. And in fact, there's a verse in the Quran uh, which states that there are 19 angels guarding the gates of hell. Then finally, the, the, the next two realms are the realm of the dominion or mulk, and then finally nasut, which is the material realm proper. These are the seven worlds. The, the seven worlds details the visionary itinerary of a deep esoteric metaphysics, enumerating the mesocosmic and metacosmic realms, a geosophy of the mundus imaginalis, or alim and mythal, the imaginal world, in its descending hierarchies, within a general discussion of mystical wayfaring, or suluk, as per the featured esoteric landscapes of the Bobby scriptural universe. Each of these descending worlds are in turn helped to symbolize with one, the seven letters of the name Ali Muhammad, which is the name of the Bab, that is, who likewise all, is also known as the essence of the seven letters, that of Huruf Then the seven Arabic letters of the divine fiat, be and it is, kun fayakun, Third, the seven creative attributive imprints of the divine, mentioned by the Shia Imams in, in Shia Hadith corpus, the seven earths, the seven planets of traditional cosmology, the seven verses of the Quran opening its first chapter, Al-Fatiha, um, and other correspondence as he makes. And all of this is rubricized within a general discussion of mystical wafering, but from the top down. Now, in a Separate but contemporaneous work, which is all prayer, Sopa Azaz summarizes all of the details of his seven worlds in a prayer, which is absolutely gorgeous. And I translated this prayer, which was the subject of an article I published in uh, 2014, entitled the seven, Invoking the Seven Worlds. And so I'm going to read you this prayer now in full um, in the translation. In thy name, O my God, and high be thy state. Glorified art thou, O my God. Verily, I beseech thee by thy sublimity at its most supreme, for the totality of thy sublimity is truly high with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy sublimity. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by the banner of thy self-subsistent peerlessness by its highest elevation, for the complete standard of thy Logos command is truly lofty with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy standard. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by the plenitude of thy tremendousness at its most expansive. For the totality of thy plenitude is truly vast with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the totality of thy plenitude. 
glorified art thou, O my God, I verily beseech thee by thy kingdom at its utmost height, for the whole of thy kingdom is truly appraised with thee. Then with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy kingdom. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by thy exaltation at the acme of its laudation, for the whole of thy exaltation is truly praised with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the totality of thy exaltation. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by thy tender graciousness at its most primeval. For all of thy graciousness is truly ancient with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy graciousness. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by thy durationless eternality at its utmost ceaselessness, for the whole of thy durationlessness is truly constant with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the totality of thy durationless eternity. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by the heavenly waters of the letter Ain, the heavenly waters of thy might, and the sublimity of thy power, and the world of thy lordship, and the supremacy of thy tremendousness, and by the heavenly waters of the letter Lam, the heavenly waters of thy magnanimity, and the banner of the sovereignty of thy self-subsistent peerlessness, and by the heavenly waters of the letter Yah, the heavenly waters of the plenitude of thy lordship, and the certainty of the essence of thy oneness and the perfection of the arrangement that is thine, and the consummation of the Logos command of thy singularity, and by the heavenly waters of the letter Meme, the heavenly waters of thy kingdom, and thy possessive dominion over all things, and the manifestations of thy loftiness, and by the heavenly waters of the letter Ha, of thy penetrating decree within that which has been created, and the life forever abiding in the worlds of thy self-subsistent peerlessness, and by the heavenly waters of the second letter meme, and what thou hast placed upon it of a state sublime, and the splendor of the imperium of power, and the majesty of the divine realm, and the luminescence of the angelic kingdom, and the supremacy of the world of mightiestness, and by the heavenly waters of the letter dal, the perpetuity of the sovereignty of thy holiness, and the permanence of the suzerain rule of thy glorification, and the durationlessness of thy logoic selfhood, and that which thou hast placed upon it of the perpetual states from the realm of thy divinity, and the vestigial signs of the sovereignty of thy self-subsistent peerlessness. And by these, the seven heavenly waters and the seven worlds, and the magnified spirits of holiness, and the metaphysical prehensions of greatness and mightiness, and the epiphanic setting pla placements of grandeur and power, and the binding knots of mercy, severity, and sovereign dominion, and the manifestations of grandeur, and what thou hast placed upon them of sublime majesty and wealth, and the apogee of beauty, and the countenance which is thine, that has risen. I beseech thee that thou mayest bestow upon me what thou hast placed upon them of beatific ex excellence, and thy spiritual attraction of glory and the noble, beneficent existence, O possessor of the beneficent existences. Glorified art thou, no other God is there besides thee, for I beseech thee, O my God, by that which I have entreated thee therein aforetime, of thy greatest names and thy gracious spirits, and thy versical signs of primordial might, and thy exalted, abounding, overflowing heavenly waters. I beseech thee that thou mayest ordain for me what thou hast preordained by thy Logos self from before, temporality, that thou mayest bestow upon me from thy presence the heavenly delight of divine proximity and the sovereignty with thee that is victorious and assured. And I beseech thee that thou mayest dignify my soul above all things by thy self-sufficiency from what thou hast created in the dominion of the earth and what how thou hast fashioned in the celestial imperience, the material creation, and the cause command. 
And I beseech thee that thou empower me within that purifying month of deliverance that is thine with what thou hast determined through thy Logos self. And that thou account me among the company of those fasting, those prayerful, those elevated, those appraised, those sincere, those abstaining, those righteous, those striving, those informed, those ripened, those noetic, those knowing, those steadfast, and those pious. No other God is there besides thee. So bestow upon me, O my God, from thy mercy that is most vast with thee, and for all of thy sustenance provided in thy sovereign kingdom, I give felicitations. Glorified art thou, no other God is there besides thee, and blessings be upon the point and its manifestations, just like thou hast shed blessings upon them from the rank of pre-eternity and the sublimity of primordiality. Glorified art thou, verily I am of the invokers. That is the prayer of the seven worlds. Now, to break down these seven worlds, Sobhazat begins the treatise by talking about the world of the divine will, the realm of the Mashiach, because in, in the Bobby metaphysics, the Godhead is radically transcendent. Um, there, we cannot talk about it in any kind of philosophical categories. We cannot talk about ascent or descent. Uh, just like in the Kabbalah when they're talking about Da'in Sof or In Sof or etc. Um, in the Bobby metaphysics, the Godhead is radically transcendent. What we can, however, talk about is the divine will or the primal will, as he calls it, uh, Mashiach al-Awwaliya, which, if you compare it with the text of Islamic metaphysics, refers to the universal intellect. So, um, the first world is the world of the Mashiach, and then he corresponds this to the planets. So, the world of the Mashiach um, is related to Sunday and to the letters Ain and Kaf, and the first verse of the Fatiha, or the first verse of the first the chapter of the Quran, which is in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, and this is, then corresponds as a sort of a mirror, the world of the will corresponds um, or relates to the world of the Ipsayati. Now in to relate this and to correspond this to the valleys of Sufism, uh, this first one would correspond to the, uh, to the realm of annihilation and subsistence, the world of the divine will. So we're way at the top of it, at the end of the journey, which is what the Sufis called fana and baqa, annihilation and subsistence. Now I should mention that the way that I have configured, especially some of these associations, uh, in the system that I have developed are slightly different than Sopaza, but generally the idea is the, is the same. The next world, number two, is the world of the volition. So we have the world of the will and then the world of the volition. Now, in Islamic metaphysics, there are two different kinds of wills. Uh, there is the, the, the active will and then there is the, the passive will. So one is the actor, one is the patient, and volition or irada is the more passive element. So it is, the, the, it is that which has been acted upon by the primal will. So this is the next world. And Sofa Azal relates that to the planet Mercury and Wednesday, and the letters Lam and Nun. Uh, and the second verse of Fatiha, this, uh, the verse of the Quran, praise be unto God, the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This would correspond to the sixth valley in conventional Sufi metaphysics, which is the valley of bewilderment, or Hayra. Number three is the world of the determination, Qadar. And Sopa Azar relates this to v, the planet Venus, and obviously Friday, the letters Ya and Fa, and the third verse of the Fatiha, the compassionate, the merciful, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And this would then correspond to the world of the Empyrean, the world of Jabarut, which is the world of the, the, the abstract archangelic intellects. And this would correspond in Sufism to um, the level of the unicity or Tawheed. Number four is the world of the auth divine authorization, Qadha. And Sopa Azad relates this to the moon, so obviously Monday, the letters Mim and Ya. The f and the fourth verse of Fatiha, Sovereign of the Day of Judgment, Maliki Yawmuddin. And this is related directly to the angelic world, Malakut. 
which then in turn corresponds to the valley of sufficiency, istikna, in, this, in the Sufi visionary quest. Number five is the world of the divine permission, is, which is also called the world of the imda, or the world of the divine realization. And Sopa Azal relates this to Mars and Tuesday, the letters Ha and Kaf, and the fifth verse of the Fatiha. To thee do we render worship, and from thee do we ask for aid. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. And this is, he relates to the mightiest world. This is the world where, like I said, heaven and hell occur, um, guarded by angels. And this is related to the third valley of the visionary quest in Sufism, which is the valley of Gnosis or Noesis, Wadi al marifa Number six is the world of the appointed time or the allotted time, Ajal. And Sopa Azal relates this to Jupiter, so Thursday. Um, the letters Mim and Wav. And so the sixth verse of Al Fatiha of the Quran. Ehdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Guide us upon the straight path. This in turn corresponds to the world of the dominion Mulk, which in Sufis, in, in the Sufi visionary quest, is the valley of love, Ishq. And finally, the final world is the world of the cosmic book, Kitab. This, Sopa Azal, relates to Saturn, so obviously Saturday, and the letters Dal and Noon. And the seventh and final verse of the Fatiha of the Quran, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed grace, not those upon whom thou hast shown wrath, or those who have gone astray. Sirat al ladina and amta alayhim, qayr al maqdubi alayhim, waladhalin. And this corresponds to the material world proper, the world of Nasu, the material world that we're in at the moment. In the treatise, in the proper treatise of the seven worlds, this all follows part of a spiritual itinerary of the itinerant seeker, uh, seeking to know the reality of the Godhead and God and the Spirit. But the way that Sopa Azal has crafted it, he works from, you know, he works from the bigger principle. So it's a kind of a, a when in logic you call a fortiori um, reasoning. Um, and then comes back down to earth. So we, if we start at the world of, of the unity and the unicity that is just incomprehensible um, with the seeker located there, and then we kind of fall, as it were, into the world of matter and its conflicts and all the, all the rest of that. But what is interesting is that all of this entire discussion in this treatise um, ultimately comes down to one thing, and that one thing is the figure of the Bob himself. So... This treatise basically revolves around what in Sopa Azal's eyes are the rea is the reality of the Bab as his guru um, disclosed to the one who comes to believe in him. Such that Sopa Azal as the Bab's mirror then basically opens up as that vehicle of the realities that in this doctrine are believed to correspond to the Bab himself. And this is basically the, the treatise of the seven worlds. I've done four drafts of this. Um, back when I was living in Berlin in, in 2016, there was um, one publisher that was interested. At the time, I decided I would not publish it because I wanted to work on it a little more because there's so much um, material in this text that can be tickled out and commented on. I thought um, I would wait a while longer before uh, putting this out. But this is basically not so bad as Treatise of the Seven World, the prayer kind of gives you a taste of, of what the main treatise itself is discussing. Um, I, I'm actually in, in rapture with this thing, even though I've, I've read very widely in, in, in an assortment of texts, whether from the Babi tradition or from you know just the panorama of, of uh, Islamic esoteric and mystical texts. I keep going back to this particular text over and over again, um, particularly as it speaks to me and to the point that there was at one point a few years ago, I was dreaming many of the, the, the episodes that he discloses, these worlds with their one, one particular part of it. In, in the second one, he talks about the world of the volition with its 70,000 suns, you know. Um, and I've had my own visionary experiences in the dream world in seeing some of the stuff that he has talked about in here. 
So I'll leave it here, my lecturing at this point. And anybody who has a question, please feel free. Movement as a, it seems like a, a kind of ecumenical movement in Islam. This, this movement you're talking about preceded it and was suppressed. Yes, but it stayed and clergy, yeah. But uh, that continued. And, and what you and how do these relate to the, to, to, to the, the Baha'i? Okay, let me write this down. The Babi movement began in 1844. Yes. The Bab appointed Supa Azal as his successor. Yes. Supa Azal's older brother, Baha'u'llah, is the founder of Baha'ism. A schism occurred in, in Ottoman Turkey. Um, Baha'u'llah claimed to be, um, because in, in the Bayani text, there's a figure that the Bab prophesizes that appears into the future, um, which he calls, he whom God shall make manifest, man Yusrullah. And, um, uh, there were a few claimants to this position even during the very early stages of Sopa Azal's ministry, but all of their claims went nowhere. But Sopa Azal's older brother made that exact claim in, in Ottoman Turkey and managed to basically then create a permanent schism uh, in the movement. So the Bayanis or the Azali Babis went one way, most of them went underground, uh, whether into the Sufi orders or also into political activism. Uh, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 was very much spearheaded uh, by the Bayani community. So um, interestingly enough, the, the discourse of constitution, democracy, and rights was actually brought into the Middle East through the constitutional revolution of 1905. And it was the Bayani or Azali Babi community that spearheaded this, working very di diligently over a 50, 60 year period until it, uh, those events fructified. The Baha'is went in a different direction um, arguably, they kind of fell under the thumb of the imperial powers, uh, beginning with the Russians, then the Tsarists, uh, and then finally, after the First World War, the British Empire itself. So, and, and they basically, the Baha'is, in many ways, became a uh, kind of this, one of the uh, you know soft powers of the Anglo-American imperial powers, and then set themselves. But the Bayanis continued in another vein in Iran. Um, much of the reformist uh, and you know, uh, liberal democratic discourses that you see coming out even in the period after the Constitutional Revolution um, appears to be from people who were in some way either their families were affiliated at an earlier generation with the Babis uh, and the Bayanis uh, or they themselves were outright. For example, uh, a very noted prime minister um, of Iran, the man who actually negotiated uh, the abdication of Reza Shah I when the British and the, Amer uh, and the Soviets invaded Iran in 1941 was Muhammad Ali Furuqi. Now, um, most of the uh, discourse in present Iran under the Islamic Republic tries to craft Furuqi as a Freemason. He was a Freemason. But he was primarily, him and his family were Bayanis, they're Azali Babis. And were it not for his efforts and his intercession, not only would the British and the Soviets have pushed um, Reza Shah out of power, which they would have done anyway, but um, Iran would have more than likely become balkanized by both the British um, and the Soviet Union. Remember that the, the Pahlavis, Reza Shah I, even though he was brought to power in 1921 by, by the British uh, in, a, in a coup d'etat, um, you know, as we were leading into the Second World War, Iran began to you know, kind of get a little too cozy for comfort with Hitler and, and, and Third Reich. And um, because of the warm waters and the oil uh, and the possibility that if there had been a Nazi you know, presence in Iran, they could have then won the war against the Soviet Union at that point. Uh, the, the British and, and the Soviet Union invaded in August 1941, deposed the king at the time. But he kind of became the broker. He negotiated a settlement sent uh, Reza Shah out of Iran into permanent exile. His younger son, Mohammad Reza, became king um, and you know, basically uh, secured Iran from being cut up and, and balkanized by the British and, and the Russians together, which had almost happened several times during the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, but he secured it. During the period of Mohammad Mossadegh, uh, the nationalist premier of Iran, democratically elected, um, there are several noted individuals within his cabinet that had family connections to the Bayanis. There is some speculation about Mossadegh himself. I don't believe that is the case. Um, but there is definitely speculation about his 
foreign minister, a very radical individual by the name of um, Dr. Fatimi. Dr. Fatimi would have become the natural successor of Mohammed Mossadegh after the 1953 coup d'etat. Unfortunately, he was um, arrested and then later executed following the 53 coup. Asad, yeah. in terms of what you've talked about, and obviously you're yeah. in, it's very close to your heart, yeah. this information. How has that affected you spiritually? In every what, conceivable what, way. What, what does it do to you, and in, in what's the processes that by taking on... It's good you ask this question. Spirituality, and especially spirituality in my part of the world, unfortunately seems to fall into a very common trap. And that is that um, it falls into a very reactionary, conservative, statist, and almost oppressive kind of trap. We've seen this many times. It is a tension that even exists, not to this degree, but um, to some degree among, between the official um, orders of Iran and those who call themselves Ghalandar Sufis. How does it affect you? It affects me in that because I am in the presence of not only a deep spirituality, but also one with a social justice and social pro progressive message that is not um, regressive, that is not going to veil women, that is not going to, you know, that is not going to follow a trajectory of looking as, as, at the past as being the golden age. This has been a, a, this is part of the metaphysics of Bobism because it sees um, God's actions in history, the presence of God's theophanies of history as a work in progress. So the theophanies and the manifestations of God are con continually perfecting themselves. Whereas, for example, if you look at um, one of the very eminent uh, theoretical opponent, opponents of the Theosophical Society, the French uh, René Guénon, and the traditional school that he's spawned, um, their point of departure in metaphysics is to work backwards in time. So that you know, the golden age of everything is at the beginning of a Manvantara. And then he's basically laying out the Hindu concept of the Manvantara, and that there is a fall in time. Well. Islamic metaphysics doesn't look at these issues that way, and which is why I have always found it strange that in my part of the world, people have been falling into these traps, because there's a very famous hadith, um, much cited by the Sufis, where um, God is speaking in the first person, he says, do not invade against time, for verily God is time, right? So not only is, is the God and the God and the divine forces um, in a, a, tem a temporal locus, but we can actually know God within time itself, which is a very, in, in some ways, if you correspond it to European philosophy, it's a very Hegelian concept. But with the metaphysics of the Bab and Sopa Azal, this is, um, this is fleshed out in an extremely symbolic archetypal way, going way beyond um, Hegel. Um, but on, in other areas, you're also in the presence of a system that can very easily discourse with something like Marxism but from a spiritual position, rather than from an antagonistic position. How so, has it affected you? In every way, well, alchemically. Alchemically? Yeah. yeah. This has been, can you explain that at all to me? Well, um, Rumi's got a great verse. He says, I can talk about, you know, um, I can talk discourse about all things, but when I come to love itself, I become shy because, you know, this is such a vast, vast topic. Um, to get to know these people through their writings um, brought me into the presence of what divine love actually means. Um, because through my teacher, it opened, I mean, people, a lot of people speculated about having visionary experiences, but the doors that he opened up to me through these particular texts and then you know, encouraged me to study, um, literally tweaked my consciousness of things as they are, you know, showing me that there's a much bigger um, agenda, as it were, larger divine agenda at work, 24/7 that we're not even seeing. Um, some of these occur within one's pedigree. Some of them are outside of one's pedigree. Other times they become a marriage of various pedigrees that then occur in a single person, like they did with him, and then as he passed it off to me. Um, I mean, I can sit here for the next week talking about each element of these things. Um, so this is alchemical and this is, you know, what is interesting, the very first, 
the night before my initiation. I've already had my conversations with my teacher. The night before my initiation, I had a very, very vivid dream that I was in Mecca. It was a full moon. There was absolutely nobody there at the Kaaba. It was just me and the Kaaba. The door of the Kaaba opens up, and a woman's voice tells me to come in. So I go in there, and there is Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, which I said is then known to be the return of my great ancestor, sitting there in green with a white veil that has written on it the divine name al Hay, the living. He tells me to sit in front of her. I sit in front of her. She takes the very famous sword of Ali, known as Zulfaqar, the double-edged sword, tells me to take, but puts her hand in my mouth, then lacerates my tongue with, with that sword. Next episode of the dream, I'm in a world where it is a world completely luminescent and all, and it's built up of flakes of gold. And as the sun rises, it's her face, this time unveiled within the sun itself. And as it rises higher and high, higher, this sun it starts to become a tree. And then I start to wake up, and then the sun, the actual physical sun, is, is shining through my bedroom window into my face and wakes me up. I'm supposed to go in a few hours after that and take the actual bayah, the hand, from my teacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. When you say initiation, does that mean you become a student? Or yes. A yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask another question? Sure, absolutely. Um, no, no. I, I, the seven worlds, they seem to correspond, in my mind, um, a lot with the theosophical seven worlds. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Just actually, one of, one of the things I would like to do is, is to look more um, closely at that, so that in, in my notes, in the future publication of this text, that all of that is kind of there, so these correspondences between the various systems of seven worlds are actually made. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually my intention to do precisely that very thing. Yeah. So the heaven and the hell aspect of, of it, to me, it's like emotional, yes. emotionalism and mental. Sure. So when we die, we process the emotionals yep. first, which is the hell of bad actions, and then we go into the mental, which we probably call diva charm. Yeah. It's the same. To me. Yeah, it's the same, yeah. 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 I think there's a lot of difference between No. But it just creates great when you're, you know, sitting and reading these things, corresponding to them, and then, you know, yeah. meditating on, on what all of this means, you know, um, that becomes a real lifetime project. It's great. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Do the uh, 360 Sabian symbols have any connection to the, the, the concept of the Allah, Allah Sabi? They do. I mean, the, the number 360 and 361 itself, um, whether we're talking about conventional Islamic gematria or the system of the Bab, represents the all things. Yeah. So the word all things, kulla shay, is 361. Um, and if you look at the, the numerology of it or the numbers of the arithmetic of it, 361 is 19 times 19. Uh, 19 itself is a very central number in the Quran, and also it's the most central number in the, in the system of the Bab. It's the number of letters that begin the Quran itself in, the, in its benediction, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that you know, the mystics have spent endless years speculating on. Um, and it's also the numerical value of one itself, Wahid, and also existence, Wujud. There's the, the concept of numbers with the Kabbalistic tree of life. There's number one and ten. Yeah. And the first major arcana numbers of the Torah, or the Torah, is one and ten. Yes. How would you distinguish between those two numbers? It's good, good, numbers? good that you asked this. I'm actually the author of my own Kabbalistic tree of 13, um, 13 spheres and, and 36 paths which take us, takes all of the pathways to 49. Um, the decad, you know, the 10, the decad is a system that, um, if you look at the history of, of, of maths and numerology, that the, the Phoenicians and the Greeks really advance. Um, but, you know, other systems, whether we're talking about India, China, or elsewhere, didn't necessarily function on the basis of a decad. So 
is, you know, this has been a debate going on for a long time but, you know, amongst mathematicians, whether the decat is actually the complete or the perfect, you know, kind of set. Um, even in, in certain Kabbalistic texts, oftentimes, for example, in the Zohar, you come across, you know, these discussions where 10 is not necessarily the perfect. I mean, the, the Zohar itself, the Bereshit Zohar, be, begins with um, the 13 lilies. This is also one of the inspirations for, for my own system of the, of the Kabbalah. Um, so I work I'm in the stages of developing a system of tarot that is, that is associated with this tree of 13 paths and 36, uh, thir 13 spheres and 36 paths. Um, and the way I have divided the system is that in, we have, um, I have a major arcana, I have a middle arcana and the minor arcana. The minor arcana is four which follows the, the suits of air, fire, water, earth. Uh, the middle arcana itself is, is related to um, the, the, the 13 spheres. And then there are 49, uh, or sorry, there are 28 uh, major arcana cards in my system that then follows the trajectory of um, the lunar mansions uh, in, in the Islamic system of, of, of cosmology. Yes. And yeah. there's extreme amount of confusion amongst many Kabbalistic scholars, particularly, that the alphabet actually starts with zero. Mm. When in fact, the number 21 is equated and 22 are equated with zero by their mathematics and um, an archetypal uh, association. Yeah, very much. It, but in the Arab. Would you agree with that? Yeah, of course I would agree with that. Oh, but, in the, <laughs> but in the Arabic system, in Arabic, you have 28 letters. But there's so much yeah. confusion about yeah. that precept, and if the Kabbalistic scholars, if they if they don't have that basis, that number one is the first numerical number that is born from the zero or, or the egg mm. of creation, and the Hebrew letter Aleph, mm -hmm. and Beth as one and two, then the whole system of astrology and planetary associations with the Ewean uh, uh, archetypes, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you know, the, um, the, the Amma and the Amma, you know, you're talking about the un unconscious elements. This is, it, this is, a, this is a huge topic, yeah. yeah. And you can go through literally hundreds of books and find that, 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 done, that they are actually out by one sign. They're actually out by more than that. Well, yeah, that's right. You know, for example, yeah. if you compare the tarot of, or the book on the tarot by LFS Levy versus everybody else, right? You know, he um, doesn't take on board the concept of zero, so he begins straight with the one. And this has been, you know, the question is, like, for example, the full zero, or is it Aleph? And if it's Aleph, then it has to be one, it can't be zero. Um, you know, once we move into someone like Alistair Crowley, you know, then he makes all these switcheroos. I decided that, um, that it was time to move beyond that for a very simple reason, because the, also a lot of the studies and scholarship that is coming now on the tarot is beginning to prove that the genesis of this system began in North Africa, and more than likely would have been amongst um, Sufi, particularly given the fact that the taroshi um, playing cards that then becomes the tarot, um, starts to appear in, in southern Italy around the 13th century. A great um, American scholar of the Sufi Ibn Arabi, um, Gerald Elmore, actually penned a series of articles before he passed away um, where he actually argues for that, and he bases it on the full card um, and the sun card, particularly. Um, and he claims that, um, in fact, there's a lot of evidence in the tarot for the doctrine of Ibn Arabi, the, the great Andalusian Sufi master, in the original, what, what would have been the original tarot. Mm. Yeah. Well, just, just one more question. Yeah. The, the, when you said Africa, then the Dogon tribe in Africa would yeah. have, and the relationship of Sirius A and Sirius B, yeah. and, which is the white, white, black star, which <coughs> is not visible. 
and the, the, the mythology of the Dagon tribe and its origins are perhaps the basis of the Shiite evolution that came out. More of, than likely. It went on to More further, than likely. further influence the Nordic tribes in Northern Europe. Yes. Well, I mean, they, they were trading. And then into yeah. Asia. Yes, for sure. Is that the truth? Well, for sure. Well, they were trading for one. There's evidence for this. Yes. Um, but North Africa, for a good three, four hundred year period, was under the dominion of the Fatimids, who were Shiite. So, more than likely, um, yeah, that these. And then, and then the, to the Nordic races in, in Europe, in Northern Europe. Yeah. Which had, you know, the. The blonde runic sense of the concept of the blonde haired, blue eyed Aryan race and its subterranean origins. We're, we're, further, we're further evolutionarily fairly developed into Indo Asia as a. Uh, um, well, uh, she, she had a question. No? <laughs> Uh, okay. Look, I just want to uh, put everybody to put their hands together. It's obviously started a lot of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we have a cup of tea there. And